Well, I thank you very much for this opportunity to come here and speak to you about a subject that I've been involved with for almost 25 years now, and especially being the uh, <clears throat> company of colleagues who have obviously done so much actually here in this country with very limited resources. I assure you that Dr. Avengord's twin study work is known around the world and we have a great deal of respect for the vaccine trials that are going on here in your country. So it doesn't go unnoticed. And I'm honored to be here and uh, share some of my thoughts. And I wanted to title this World Public Health Issues because it really is a worldwide problem. It is not isolated to the United States or to Sweden or to South Africa or anywhere else. And we really must get that perspective. And we need to have that perspective as we go forward in the study and treatment of this disorder. Now, as many of you know, I was sitting at Lake Tahoe with my very quiet practice back in 1983, 25 years ago, when suddenly about 190 people became ill with a flu-like illness, from which most of them have not recovered. So this was very dramatic on a young physician's practice, and it's sort of been my life's uh, commitment to understand this disease and to develop appropriate diagnostics and therapies. Back at the time, I had no idea that 25 years later, I'd still be looking for the answers to those questions. But I can actually assure you patients that things are moving faster finally in the last few years and more accomplishments are being made. And I think there's hope for the future, building on the past. So as an overview, I want to review some of the background with respect to issues that have been present in chronic fatigue in the past. I want to address the definitions that are somewhat uh, critical to our understanding and going uh, forward. The agencies that have been involved in chronic fatigue syndrome in the U.S. and what they have to offer and what they don't have to offer, uh, including the federal agencies as well as the private institutions that have been such a, a big participant in the areas of chronic fatigue research. And then lastly, I want to address the AIM initiative and the use of informatics. Those are concepts that may be new to you, but I think they're very important in the area of chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, as many of you know, <clears throat> back when, and I was unfortunately part of this labeling, the syndrome was known as yuppie flu. And that's because the, most of the patients who presented and had the money and the energy to present were young, affluent women. Shortly thereafter, the name chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome was developed, uh, recognizing the importance of the immune dysfunction in the syndrome. And I think as far as biomarkers go, immune dysregulation is the most reliable, reproducible finding uh, in cross-sectional studies in all the cultures where it's been looked at. Ultimately, as you've heard, it became known as chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a trivializing name, uh, emphasizing one of the key features and very little else about the disease. Certainly doesn't tell us anything about the fat pathogenesis or the severity or the disability. The Jap Japanese, I think, were somewhat more enlightened, uh, where the name has been uh, called low natural killer cell syndrome after the most remarkable immune abnormality, and that is low function of the natural killer cells. And of course, in the UK, the disease is known as myalgic encephalomyelitis. Now recently in the United States, <clears throat> in order to foster worldwide understanding, we've changed the name to CFS slash ME, uh, pending a better name that more accurately reflects either the pathogenesis or uh, other central features of the disorder. Now, this is really the beginning and the last slide that I need to show because it dramatically tells you what problem we're facing with this particular disease. The cost per year in the U.S. is estimated to be $9 billion in direct medical costs. In Sweden, if you extrapolate the figures, that would be 1.6 billion Swedish kroner per year. It's an extremely costly disease, exceedingly costly disease to individuals and to society, and that really must be addressed. In the U.S., 10% of patients consume 70% of the resources. It's a staggering figure. Of this, most of that is spent in the diagnosis and management of chronic disease, hypertension, diabetes, 
cardiovascular disease. Chronic fatigue ME is a significant contributor to this financial burden, as well as, a, as not being able to really put an estimate on functional disability and the cost that that has on individual patients and their families. So to dispel a couple of myths, one, the first myth that I always like to get rid of is that it's rare. Every study around the world has agreed that it's not rare. The prevalence in the United States of 0.04 or 400 to 600 per 100,000 means there's at least 800,000 people in the U.S., probably closer to a million. Again, depends on which definition you use, and that's a problem in our field. Number of people in Sweden, I agree with the estimates here, between 32,000 and 40,000 people. What that translates to is that you need at least 15 or 20 specialists trained in this country in order to take care of that number of people effectively using standard ratios for specialty care to number of people affected. In the U.S. it translates to about 500 specialized physicians. If you want to look at it from the standpoint of Centers for Excellence, it would be estimated that we should have about 30 of those in the United States. If you translate that, it means you should have two Centers of Excellence in a country the size of Sweden. The second myth is that the highest prevalence is again amongst young, affluent white. The fact is that women, men, and children from all socioeconomic backgrounds develop CFS. There is a sex bias for females, but it's not unheard of for males to have this disease. At least at the Lake Tahoe, it was about 30 to 40 percent. Race has been another myth. <clears throat> Leonard Jason studied race in his telephone interviews in Chicago, and in fact, the disease is more common amongst Latinos, more common amongst Afri uh, African Americans than it is amongst Caucasians. However, minority groups rarely get access to the medical system in the United States, so they're grossly understudied. I think the most overlooked population and the most unfortunate is children. Children are rarely diagnosed and they're understudied. And it's a shame because chronic fatigue syndrome has a tremendous impact on their educational achievement. They simply become school failures and it results in significant health identity confusion and very prolonged disability. So it's bad enough to get the illness when you're 40. Imagine when you're 11 and you face 70 years of a disabling illness. The economic impact of CFS is both to the individual and to the society. Now Leonard Jason just completed and published this very interesting study and I want to spend a few moments on it because I think it's really quite important. And he logicked that an illness that is so debilitating and so prevalent must have a tremendous cost on society. Economic impact can be divided into two areas, direct costs and indirect costs. And on his results, using a prevalence of 0.042, he showed an annual direct cost of $8,600 per patient, or a total cost to our society of about $7 billion. Now, those direct costs were simply office visits, medications, diagnostic testing, uh, and ancillary testing. Very simple to measure. There are other economic costs, obviously, including missed work, lack of productivity, high disability status. Based on a general estimate of that, he felt that the indirect costs were approximately 20,000 per patient per year or an additional 17 billion dollars. Now there were a few problems with this study. One is that they used archival data, there were data estimates, and it was patient self-reporting about how often they went to the doctor and things like that. But together the indirect and direct costs of MECSF is estimated to be 17 to 24 billion dollars in the United States per year. So it's a major health item for our health care system, which is why insurance companies and the government now take it so seriously. If you look at it from a, a different, an optimistic or a entrepreneurial perspective, if we had a single diagnostic test that you could do on your blood and diagnose chronic fatigue syndrome, it would yield about $200 million per year. 
And if we had a therapy that was effective that took six months of therapy, the estimated market potential for a drug manufacturer would be about $500 million per year. So it clearly, even from an entrepreneurial point of view, justifies additional research on the part of the drug companies, on the part of the companies that develop test development. Now classification is very critical and you'll see in a moment why this is. And there's international classification of disease and there's a World Health Organization that's responsible for this. And in the United States we still use the ICDM-9 criteria which are now old, but Chronic fatigue syndrome is identified as its own identifier, 780.71, as every American chronic fatigue patient knows, which identifies them as having an organic, biologically based disease. There is difficulties, however, with 780.71, and that is that it presumes uh, a homogeneous group of patients, and clearly these are, these are very heterogeneous group of patients. They don't all have neurological problems. They aren't all post-viral. They don't all have immune system abnormalities. And there's obviously overlap, as we heard an earlier speaker, with fibromyalgia and uh, primary psychiatric diagnosis. So the World Health Organization in Geneva, who is responsible for establishing disease classifications, does have the category of post-viral fatigue, very similar to the ICDM-9, G93.3, and they also have neurasthenia and fatigue syndromes, F48.0, which is where many patients in the United Kingdom end up being classified. We still use the, uh, we have still not adapted the ICD-10 criteria, and once again, oftentimes physicians use diagnostic codes that reflect symptoms rather than a disease process, such as malaise and fatigue, uh, other malaise, other chronic fatigue non-specified, or viral encephalitis. The World Health Organization has a website that addresses this and how one goes about getting new diseases added to it. It's quite a cumbersome process. Reimbursement is not a factor in deliberation of an ICDM placement. However, having said that, third party payers and governmental agencies frequently utilize these coding systems to determine coverage, reimbursement, and disability. It's a big problem in the United States because if you get classified as a psychiatric disability, your, your benefits are limited to two years. So. I, of course, looked to the U.S. government to solve my problem when I had this outbreak at Lake Tahoe, and I called the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and they, in fact, responded and investigated and filed a report that there was an unusual illness that may or may not be related to viruses that had occurred. The agencies that have been involved in chronic fatigue syndrome at the national level in the United States are the CDC, the National Institutes of Health, through their trans-NIH program, that spans across different agencies, and the Department of Human Health Services. Now you can imagine, these are absolutely huge federal agencies that are known to be slow to respond and underfunded. The Center for Disease Control has taken a primary role. They have a website addressing chronic fatigue syndrome. It's updated infrequently. Uh, it does have some nice packages of information for patients and physicians. The CDC philosophy with respect to chronic fatigue syndrome is CFS is a serious illness and poses a dilemma for patients, their families, and their health care providers. I personally believe that's a bit of an understatement. CDC does acknowledge basic facts about the disease, that patients have substantial lower levels of activity, that the disease may persist for years, the cause has not been identified and there is no one specific diagnostic test, prevalence of 0 0.04 or greater than 1 million people, and stunningly there may be tens of millions of patients worldwide affected. Risk factors we've heard before, more common in women, more common in the 40s and 50s, and children can be diagnosed. 
The CDC case definition, <clears throat> again, is the gold standard in the United States. It's really required if you're doing research <clears throat> or attempting to publish or instituting drug trials. They do have guidelines, uh, including the necessity to do a physical examination, uh, necessity to exclude all other known illnesses that can cause similar symptoms. And that's where the cost of the diagnosis gets driven up. In the U.S. right now, it costs about $12,000 to rule out all the other disorders that could possibly cause sim similar symptoms. And of course, we've seen those before. There's exclusionary diagnoses, which are uh, tr other treatable disorders that result in similar symptoms, as well as a variety of uh, psychiatric disorders that cannot coexist with chronic fatigue syndrome by definition. There are also in the revised criteria, which I will come back to later in the 2003 revisions, which are generally considered to be the 94 criteria, it does allow coexisting illness if those are well-controlled problems like hypothyroidism or a previous infection that was successfully treated. So the CDC in their current position of chronic fatigue syndrome acknowledged that CFS is a serious impairment with an unemployment rate of 25%. Almost no other disease has an unemployment rate of 25%. <clears throat> Many patients go undiagnosed. Earlier diagnosis and treatment results in decreased morbidity. Striking, particularly where I heard earlier that it takes five or ten years perhaps to get a diagnosis in this country. Forty percent of the population diagnosed with chronic fatigue like symptoms actually have other treatable disorders. And that's why the CDC requires an exhaustive workup to be sure that something else is not going on. We have a historical series of events here that you've heard previously. In 1988, the Holmes criteria were established. These strongly represented research guidelines. They were to study the disease. They weren't meant to be clinical guidelines. They excluded a number of patients. They looked for pure cases, and it heavily favored post-infectious etiologies. It uh, is still around. Many of people who are involved in research, will, if you'll read their publications, they say meet the 88 as well as the 94 criteria. The British definition was designed in 1990. It's not really too different. It uh, is a little bit more general. The Australian definition, uh, again, somewhat similar. However, there's an emphasis in the Australian definition on post-infectious etiologies, and there is an emphasis on neuropsychiatric dysfunction. Again, in uh, Australia, you see a lot of interest in the uh, post-Q uh, fever, post-Ross River virus, etc. The 94 criteria came about uh, as a revision from the CDC. These are known as the Fukuda criteria, and uh, they remain the research criteria in the United States, the gold standard for diagnosis even though they're substantially flawed and expensive. The revisions were made in 2003. As far as patients go, these are relatively minor uh, revisions. As far as physicians go, they complicate our work considerably uh, because of all the coexisting factors that you can and cannot have. This resulted in the uh, Canadian government calling a meeting of physicians from around the world to work on a consensus definition in 2003. And it was an interesting process because physicians from all over the world met to decide how we should define this disease, to write diagnostic protocols, and to write pre treatment protocols. And this is actually the most widely used definition by clinicians. And that's because it emphasizes patients and patients' care, it's easy to implement, and it includes treatment guidelines. And actually, this is the definition that is used most widely in the United States by practicing physicians who aren't involved in research. 
It's a clinical working case definition, includes diagnostic and treatment pro protocols, and it has been published. The mistake that was made, it was named the Canadian Consensus Document, and it should have been named the Worldwide Consensus Document, in my opinion. It differs in some critical ways in that it emphasizes, as Dr. Avangord said, these other symptoms of autonomic dysfunction and cognitive dysfunction. It acknowledges pain. It acknowledges neuroendocrine manifestations and specifically addresses immune manifestations. It's a little looser on the length of time that you have to be disabled, and that's an attempt to make earlier diagnosis. The neurocognitive manifestations should be common to every patient in this room. You should recognize this. Confusion, difficulty concentrating, disorientation, perceptual disturbances, ataxia, muscle weakness, fasciculations. These, you will note, were not in the 88 or the 94 criteria. The fatigue, of course, has to be very uh, nuanced, unexplained, persistent, recurrent, reduce your activity level. Post-exertional malaise is emphasized, and for the physicians in the room, I think that's a very important feature. Very few diseases cause a major relapse of symptoms with mental and or physical exertion. Chronic fatigue is one of them. It's always the question I ask on a first visit. There's a pathological slow recovery. One of the techniques we use to diagnose the syndrome and assess the severity now is to do exercise tolerance tests two days in a row. The pay, most normal controls do exactly the same on the second day in a stress test. The chronic fatigue patients do markedly worse on the second day demonstrating objectively the post-exertional malaise. The sleep dysfunction is emphasized in the Canadian consensus definition, as is pain. The pain may be diffuse or localized. There are other symptoms, of course, that are similar to the other definitions. Illness duration is similar, except that it can be diagnosed earlier in children, again, in an attempt to make a more accurate and earlier diagnosis. The 94 definition, again, is the one, however, accepted for research publication and research design, such as drug trials. The CDC maintains on their website a tool sheet for physicians and patients. It's easy to click on that menu and print out a question uh, form that you can answer yourself to see if you fit the criteria. Physicians can download the various tools. The CDC also has an awareness campaign of $9 million to alert the public to the disorder. They published uh, magazine articles and advertisements and television spots and things like that in an attempt to educate the general population, not so much physicians. The National Institutes of Health, of course, is our nation's medical research agency. And they maintain a website as well, talking about all their activities and all their diseases. And the Department of Human Health Services established an advisory committee for study of chronic fatigue syndrome. Now this was very interesting, and this was actually done at the patient's request. They made a committee that included uh, seven representatives of the healthcare field and four public representatives, patient advocates, that sort of thing. And they were brought together in order to do public advisory activity for the NIH. Now there's different agencies represented on this committee, which is where the potential power would have been. The National Institutes of Health representing research the Center for Disease Control for Education and Prevention and Counting, HEADS, the Food and Drug Administration in case the therapy comes about, Health and Human Resources, it's obvious, and Social Security Administration to set guidelines for disability. The uh, committee was established in 1996. It does hold meetings. It has had some activity. It has addressed expansion of CSF uh, biomedical research. It has made many, many requests for development of more research. It has suggested the establishment of centers for area. And they state CFS is a clinically diagnosable condition with a well-documented history. 
They have a problem, however, with researching the disorder in an agency as large as the NIH because the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome are variable in severity, not homogeneous, making research studies and diagnostic criteria very difficult. They do have uh, several funded programs and they do allow regranting. The problem with this is that it's a, span, it's a trans agency program. So it spans women's health, social sciences, abuse and alcoholism, musculoskeletal and skin diseases, environmental health sciences, and neurological diseases. So chronic fatigue syndrome has no home within the NIH. NIH is also chronically underfunded. It funded only 7% of grant requests this year. Now there are international organizations that have attempted to bridge this gap in establishing research protocols and treatment guidelines. And I'm just going to talk about a few of these as examples for you here in Sweden to think about what you might go forward with. The IACFS is an international organization. The Allison Hunter is in Australia. The CFS Japan does a great deal of research on fatigue science and are really at the cutting edge. ME Research UK and the Irish ME Trust. IACFS is an organization in the United States that has maintains a website. It, it was established to bring together researchers, clinicians, healthcare workers, and support groups to further the discussion, research, treatment, and education. It became international in 2005, recognizing the international uh, nature of the disease. It is it does focus on educational projects for professionals and non-professionals. They do award uh, outstanding clinicians and researchers, and they sponsor a very excellent uh, semi-annual research conference, which is coming up in March of 2009. I invite any of you interested to come to that. It's always, always a very good meeting with lots and lots of patients and a uh, fair number of physicians. Their mission is to promote, stimulate, and coordinate the exchange of ideas related to CFS, ME, and fibromyalgia. They do re, uh, review research and treatment and uh, develop guidelines. They uh, conduct or uh, participate in local, national, and international conferences. The leadership is really awesome there, uh, including your own Dr. Avengord, who is the vice president of that organization, very active in that organization. It's a, it's a very stimulating and uh, proactive group of physicians for the, the large part that are the directorship. They are in the developmental phase of treatment guidelines using uh, their board members outside consultations in attempting to produce evidence-based treatment guidelines, which is always a request that I hear from physicians around the world. What should they do with these patients? The Allison Hunter Memorial Foundation in Australia uh, serves sort of a similar function in Australia. It is geared toward patient issues. Again, they stress that the patient must be individually treated. Scientific evidence must be applied to the diagnosis and treatment. Uh, the medical community must be educated uh, because early diagnosis and aggressive therapy can alter the outcome. And again, there's very significant disability. And in Australia, there's very few physicians and there are no centers of excellence. Again, they emphasize the post-infectious nature of the disorder. <clears throat> they have a nearly a total lack of appropriate diagnostics and management. It's very difficult to even get diagnostic studies performed in Australia for the exclusionary criteria, much less for the specific studies that are abnormal and chronic fatigue. They lack a primary as well as tertiary centers for the care of these patients. The a Japanese organization is very well organized, as you might expect. They're very well funded, and they are doing very, very astounding studies into what actually causes fatigue in general, as well as virological and immunological studies in the area of chronic fatigue syndrome. As you've heard, their meeting is coming up in September. 
The ME Research UK is a national charity which funds basic biomedical research into the causes, consequences, and treatment of ME. They are committed to identifying and funding biomedical projects, publishing scientific papers, and producing high quality professional review. And I'll just give you one example of what they funded and how important it is. They were responsible for funding Jonathan Kerr's study on gene expression in chronic fatigue syndrome. He's published two papers. It's moved us forward light years in a very short period of time in the world with respect to credibility, reproducibility. Privately funded. The Irish ME Trust is a similar organization in Ireland that has taken upon themselves to really watch out for the interest of the patient. Their mission to alleviate hardship experienced by sufferers. It shouldn't be so unique. We shouldn't be marveling that an organization wishes to do that. Provide information and counseling services and sponsor educational programs within Ireland. Well, since it took about 25 years to make progress in the United States, we turned to private associations and foundations. And I just want to review those quickly and give you an idea of what's going on in the United States to address some of these problems outside of the governmental se uh, segment. The CFIDS Association of America, most of you have heard about them. They do an excellent job of patient education. They have an excellent website. I think it's the best website out there with respect to information for patients. They, their history, they were founded in 1987 to stimulate high quality CFS research. One of their goals is to try to improve the quality of healthcare professionals. They address this very head on. Physicians don't know the disease and don't know what to do about it. The organization has invested $25 million in this process already in education, public policy, and research. They're having a year-long celebration of their 20th year of existence. They lobby heavily at the federal level for annual appropriations. They participate in congressional advocacy for legislature, recognizing the seriousness and the disabling nature of the disease. They have a full-time lobbyist employed to work the Washington scene. They disseminate information with respect to advocacy and na national issues. And they will also support local issues such as physician and patient education. They support educational meetings. Their national concerns are that of these 3,500 publications that we heard of earlier, none of them uh, include clear-cut guidelines. There are few recognized experts. There are no centers for excellence. There is a failure rate at diagnosing of at least 80%. Globally, they feel this inexperience is the same around the world as it is in the United States. Inadequate training of physician remains a huge obstacle because there's demands on physicians' time and interest. And we need to look for other diseases, perhaps, to establish the proper <coughs> model for diagnosis and treatment. They do congressional activities, advocacy, and disseminate information. Co-Cure ME is based in Massachusetts. It's another organization that operates nationally. They have a website as well. It's a little bit different because they maintain uh, lists of referral doctors, research updates, clinical updates, educational information. It's a very easy place if you're into blogging to find what's going on in uh, research and physicians and which physicians are taking new patients and things like that. It's very useful for the patients. <clears throat> About 10 years ago, I began working on a private institute as a center of excellence for the diagnosis and treatment of CFS. And there's a picture uh, artist rendition of the building that I'm happy to say we've had groundbreaking on, so estimated completion for the building in September 2010. There's our executive committee, our scientific advisory committee is Bill Murphy, Ken Hunter, Nancy Klimas, Frank Rossetti from NIH, Susan Vernon from the uh, CFIDS Association and Carl Ware. And this is the rationale that I used to institute this clinic. One in 300 U.S. citizens suffer from MECFS. One in 750 suffer from MS. 
So it's twice as common as MS. One in 158 boys suffers from autism. Autism shares similar immune dysregulation to chronic fatigue syndrome. One in 150 suffer from fibromyalgia, and these diseases are on the rise and probably not from increased surveillance. Our mission is to facilitate and advance patient care and to research the pathophysiology of neuroimmune diseases and to develop therapeutics, diagnostics, and prevention strategies all under one roof with collaboration with the rest of the world. We view this as a unique center of excellence model with comprehensive outpatient evaluation, <clears throat> including dedicated physicians and basic research, a first-of-its-kind institute dedicated specifically to neuroimmune disease, integrating patient treatment, basic and clinical research, and medical education. This is based on translational medicine that says the bench researcher needs to communicate with a private doctor very directly. So we located the center at the Center for Molecular Medicine. It has three components. It has the Division of Biomedical Research, the Clinical Institute and the Nevada Cancer Institute. The reason we associate with the Nevada Cancer Institute is there's a good fit in the basic research clinical trials and sharing uh, facilities. Again, the integrative mission between these three departments is to reveal the mechanism of chronic disease and to develop new treatment strategies. We want to use rapid pass-through techniques for drug development. The patient remains the center of our emphasis. They will be evaluated, including brain scans, to meet the uh, ME criteria. Diagnostic studies, which we're already doing for the herpes viruses, fungi, and other uh, disease, uh, infectious diseases, as well as immunological studies. And most importantly, the patients leave with a comprehensive treatment plan. Uh, there is also personnel available to address legal issues, nutritional issues, environmental issues, and rehabilitation potential. This protocol is given to the patient regardless of whether they come back to the institute or go back to their primary care physician. Current research that's being conducted at the institute right now is gene expression profiling. You've all heard about that. We do DNA gene uh, studies looking for SNPs or unusual mutations that patients may have. We do messenger RNA gene expressions to look at subsetting. Uh, and again, Dr. Kerr has done that in London. Virus expression profiling, we have a viral array that we're using on all patients, uh, looking for all 4,000 known human viral pathogens. We look at clonal T cell rearrangement gamma because that's an indicator of neoplasm and we want to prevent uh, neoplastic disorders in these patients if we can. We're looking at chromosomally integrated HHV6 and of course we're looking at cytokine arrays as you've heard earlier. It's very exciting basic research. The major problems, of course, are inadequate funding and uncoordinated efforts. Here's the NIH estimates of funding for various diseases per annum in the United States. 164 million per year for diseases of climate change, interstitial cystitis, 23 million, mind and body connection, 128 million, Parkinson's disease, 186 million, and chronic fatigue syndrome, 4 million. The clinical component, again, will include treatment and education. We also have a problem with educating physicians in this disease because it's a complex problem. We plan to have a training program there involving student uh, interns, graduate internships, and fellowships. And that plan is in conjunction with the University of Nevada, Reno, so that we can train physicians appropriately in the diagnosis and treatment of this disorder. Current funding, this is how we put the clinic together. And always I'm asked, how did, how did you do this? How did you get the funding for this? We had $5 million in a private pledge. We got $4.5 million from the Nevada State Legislature. We got $1.5 million from the federal government and we got $1 million in private donations. That enabled us to get the building, that enabled us to get two years of operational costs, that enabled us to recruit the research division. There's a picture of the building. 
You'll note that this uh, front side that you see is the auditorium and the clinical side and the research building is in the back. There's an overview of it. You can see how it's directly connected to the medical school. We did that intentionally so that we can continue translational medicine. The scientists can't get away from the patients. They're forced to use the same cafeteria, the same entrances, so they see the reality of the disease. It was not well received. We fought hard to do this, but succeeded at least in building design. Now I want to turn to perhaps more enlightened approaches to a complex disease such as this. And in the United States, it's become a mandate now that <clears throat> we use AIM goals. And the triple AIM concept was designed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement that is a giant think tank that is revising American healthcare. American healthcare is broken. Physicians hate it, patients hate it, and insurance companies hate it. So what could be right about it? And it's extremely costly. So in revising it, they have developed the AIM criteria that says healthcare must be centered around the experience of the individual. That individual's experience then has to be extrapolated to the society, and then it has to be cost effective. And then we have a perfect healthcare system. So <clears throat> they advocate, establish an entity responsible for the integration of health services for the defined population, or the macro integrator as they call it, and providing customized and individual services for the patient and family, or the micro integrators. And in my opinion, this is exactly what chronic fatigue, ME, requires. It requires a system that can afford to take care of all of these patients, and yet gives individualized services that the patient requires. So, in this direct model, it requires extrapolation, and that's the difficult part. Most physicians know exactly what they should do for the patients. They don't know how society should deliver that. And the model must be cost effective or it'll never sell at the governmental level. Here's the synopsis of the triple aim. The patient sits right smack dab in the middle experience of care, the population health, and the per capita cost. The philosophy here is that if we design the perfect system for the patient, we can then try it out at the population at large, then we'll figure out a way to pay for it. It's being used for all diseases. It's being used for diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and it's been mandated the top 10 diseases in the United States already have to comply with this model. Informatics is another tool that I think we'll see used in chronic fatigue syndrome and I encourage the physicians here as well as the patients to consider informatics. It was a foreign concept to me when I was introduced to it two or three years ago. And it's rather complex, but I'll try to uh, show it to you in a summary fashion. It, the, the basics are that there's a host response signature to anything that happens in our environment that can be measured your weight, your temperature, your immune system, presence or absence of viruses, etc. It can be measured and recorded and put in a database. Informatics can also do surveillance. They can log every person with chronic fatigue syndrome who's registered in the world and follow them over time very simply. It's very useful for clinical trials and therapeutic monitoring and you can utilize uh, baseline databases that are throughout the world. And the example I give people is the DNA ba databases across the United States are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's worldwide databases. So criminals are submitted, of course, to DNA testing, and they just see if they've ever been arrested before. It's really become rather simple. And we can access the same kind of databases to look for patterns of illness, patterns of therapy, if there was a registry, if there was a worldwide registry of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. And that's one of the things we're working on. So it's, the theory is that you can use these genomic nosologies in order to diagnose and to treat. And this is really a new paradigm, particularly for physicians. And what it says is, we used to rely solely on clinical medicine. Now we have to add biotechnology to that, including genomics. We have to consider the databases. How were 100,000 other patients managed throughout the world that had this problem? 
And genomics says, what are they likely to respond to? What are they likely to be allergic to? And how can we measure their clinical response? Ultimately, resulting in an individualized diagnosis and therapy in a relatively quick and efficient period of time. You can mine large uh, databases with using this technique in population screens. And what's interesting about this is it can be applied to heterogeneous <coughs> registries. So I could compare my data with Swedish data if they were in the same format, and we could do uh, lots of communication back and forth with respect to what kind of techniques work, which don't, how to diagnose, how not to diagnose, how to treat, how not to treat. You get direct provider feedback quickly because you're asking a question about your patient and they're being compared to a huge database. So you quickly get an answer back, no, that's the wrong drug, that's the wrong dose, think of something else, etc. We're using this in the United States now for micro microbial resistance and antibiotic prescribing. And it turns out that these large informatic databases do better than individual physicians do at determining the proper antibiotic. So this really brings about a, a different clinical paradigm if you think about it. Traditionally, health was interrupted by illness. That resulted in testing and more testing and more testing and more testing. And finally, a clinical decision, usually with an intervention, uh, perhaps recovery, back to health. That's the process we've used for hundreds of years. It's the one I was trained in. It's very inefficient. This new paradigm says, no, take advantage of everything that's out there. Take advantage of computers and web pages and registries and automated systems of diagnosis, et cetera, and let the informatics help you. So the new paradigm says health is determined by your genetic profile, we can do quicker diagnostics, we can avoid all the additional testing, we can arrive at a clinical decision and shortcut the pathway back. And in closing, I welcome collaboration with similar institutes, healthcare organizations, government bodies, internationally, including Sweden and Scandinavian countries. Uh, join us in this effort at Conquering Chronic Fatigue Center. And thanks for your attention. This study is supposed to be released in June at the HHV6 meetings. Uh, I know they've been somewhat mixed. We used both sides of patients who had activity serologically for HHV6 and Epstein Barr virus. Certainly, in my experience, about 15% of the patients uh, do present with viral reactivation and they do sometimes respond to antiviral therapy. What was the question? Uh, the question was about Dr. Montoya's study at Stanford using uh, Volsite, it's an oral antiviral uh, for patients who have, uh, he had a very, very, very strict criteria for entrance into that study. Um, it was a relatively uh, small study, but we'll be interested in seeing the results. It was based on a pilot study that had uh, very good preliminary results. That's a long question. <laughs> Interesting. Well, certainly we all, all of us utilize symptomatic therapy. If you don't sleep, we try to help you sleep. If you have pain, we try to treat the pain. If you have poor energy, we try to energize you. You don't just like poor vigil and things like that. But I think the most basic um, therapies are, are going to be based and have been based on subsetting patients. And I'll give you an example. In those patients that have evidence of viral reactivation. Their RNA cells are sky high, their cytokines are sky high, and they have positive PCRs for viruses. I treat them with antivirals. For patients who have evidence of immune uh, dysregulation, 
I use similar therapies to those that were uh, mentioned earlier with the vaccine. I use a different agent. I uh, use Ampligen, poly i c 12 u and or intravenous gamma-globulin that is an immune modulating agent. So our philosophy is exactly the same. That's a group that I see all the time because I end up being in the tertiary referral business. The difficulty with the patient who's actually bed bound is it's hard for them to get around. It's hard for them to access the healthcare system and it's hard to use services. The, uh, there's part of the institute here that I didn't show. We have an inpatient unit there where we'll be able to keep people up to five days like that so they can complete their diagnostic testing and begin some kind of therapeutic strategy. Sometimes there's really easy things that can be done, like a uh, bedridden patient may have low blood pressure, and you can utilize three times a week saline, and they can at least get up and move around, just as an example. I don't know this particular patient's background, but there are some more breath. They may be, uh, she may be a candidate for uh, immunomodulatory therapy. Certainly, the, uh, for example, amperage in the United States can only be used on the very severely disabled. They have to have a chronoscopy score of, of 40 or below, which is basically almost bedridden. So there are some strategies available for that severe group of patients. They do have a high uh, morbidity, and they do have an increased mortality um, due to coexisting illnesses and to suicide. So it's a concern of all of us who um, treat this disorder. Um. The health care organization here in Stockholm is producing a preliminary report that was uh, mentioned in the beginning. Uh, this report um, clearly states that there are no biomedical indicators or evidence of a physical disease. Uh, uh, from a scientific uh, point of view, is there really scientific support to deny CFS as a disease? That's a classical position that has been taken by governmental agencies about 10 years ago. And it's uh, certainly been counteracted in the literature with respect to organicity. Uh, it, it is a minority position in the world, and it is not accepted by most practicing physicians and organizations. Thank you. There is. Uh uh, another issue in this report I would like to get your view on. The report discusses uh, MECFS as another one in the line of illnesses with medical unexplained symptoms. Uh, and in the, an illness that can be understood in a biophysical social model. Uh, a model that is, if I quote it, given more and more support and is the dominated perspective, end of quote. And, and this model states that uh, also social and psychological parameters has to be included to uh, understand the illness. Uh, do you have any comments on, on this biopsychosocial model? Is, is that the main stream in, in this uh, ME uh, scientific research? Um, I believe that refers to this categorization as some other form of disorder, which we do not use in the United States and is not a predominant opinion. And it, uh, certainly there are psychiatric factors that come into play in these patients that get secondary depression, anxiety, etc., uh, just like most patients with chronic illnesses do. However, I think it's totally inappropriate and ignoring 3,500 papers to say this is a somatoform disorder. Thank you. Uh, a last question then. Um, you, you told us about this different kind of, of um, um, d definitions. Um, what, what definition would you really recommend for clinical purposes? Is, is the Canadian consensus 
definition, the one that is most appropriate for, for the clinical purposes, or, or what is your issue? I use it exclusively for clinical purposes. I think it's the best, it's very easy to use. Any physician can download the forms, they come as a checkoff list, you can just check off whether they meet the criteria or not. You can go on to the diagnostics about what you should order and what you shouldn't order, and you can go on to suggested treatment strategies. It has become somewhat dated now, it's five years old. There is talk about um, revising it. I hope the ICFS and their guidelines, um, and Dr. Abel will probably address this better than I, will have updated um, diagnostic and therapeutic strategies once they're done with their committee work, which I believe is in process. Is that correct? Yes, it is. So I'm looking forward to those guidelines because that is a world organization, and I think they, they will be um, more useful to uh, everybody. With respect to that. Could you comment uh, anything on uh, hypothyroidism type 2? Um, insensitivity to T3? Pardon? Insensitivity to T3 are you referring about? Uh, I'm talking about uh, insensitivity to the uh, thyroid hormones due to biocides or Right, right. There's a, there's, a, uh, there's a subcategory of patients that seem to have adequate amounts of circulating T4 and T3 and have end organ insensitivity to the actions of thyroid hormone. That group of patients that has been described in endocrinology for many, many years, there, there may be, a, they're hard to diagnose, and there may be a subset of chronic fatigue patients that have elements of that present. Uh, they demonstrate generally increased levels of reverse T3, and in all the patients that I have seen, I've found maybe five in all the years that I've been screening for that. More questions? We can hear almost every day on the news about athletes using, using drugs to improve their efficiency or running twice as fast tomorrow as they did today. Now, isn't there anywhere amongst all these drugs that could, you could find could be used? <laughs> <laughs> An intriguing question or what? Well, I, the most straightforward answer is we certainly use uh, some central nervous system stimulators in terms of vigil and uh, the amphetamine like drugs. All of the practicing physicians for this, who treat patients with this disease, do that for isolated cases. With respect to growth hormone, there is a group of patients with chronic fatigue who have abnormal insulin like growth factor 1, and they have low growth hormones, and they don't respond appropriately to growth hormone releasing hormone stimulation. So they indeed have growth hormone deficiency of adulthood, and they don't have brain tumors, etc. It may relate to the sleep disorder, because growth hormone is secreted in the early, early morning. So maybe that the patients with the sleep disorder um, have abnormalities of growth hormone. Interestingly, if you treat those patients with growth hormone, they have a very dramatic response. So in, in reality, they probably don't have chronic fatigue syndrome, they have adult growth hormone deficiency. But I think those are the, the androgenic steroids I don't think have any role in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. So in, in general, those are the, the drugs that are used by athletes to <laughs> improve their performance. So in fact, we use the people who prescribe the ones under unusual circumstances. Oh.
the site. Uh, could you please repeat the question? Oh, the question was, she stated that she had leukemia and had heavy chemotherapy for leukemia and has been, had a, a lot of symptoms of fatigability after the, the chemotherapy. Uh, oncologists generally say that that's expected from chemotherapy. I had uh, the opportunity to watch people who have had chronic fatigue syndrome who have developed neoplastic disease had treatment versus patients who don't have chronic fatigue syndrome have developed neoplastics and had treatment. They clearly chronic fatigue patients do worse. So what we're looking for is various factors that may be involved uh, that, such as viral reactivation from the immune suppressors that you received, in particular during the transplant. We certainly see, you know, if you want to take HHV6 for a day as an example, it's certainly known to reactivate after transplant, but the transplant literature is full of case studies of HHV6 reactivation post transplant, uh, as well as CMV. So we keep a careful, every so often I get to, to see people like yourself, that I make every special effort to make sure that there's not something else going on. One of the things about you know, patients who have long-standing HIV, you have 25 years survivors of HIV, huh? and many of them have profound fatigue, even though they have zero viral loads. So there's a lot of secondary research uh, with respect to mitochondrial, whether uh, mitochondrial disorders, whether it's the chemotherapy that's been cumulative and toxic over the many, many years, or whether it's something to do about their low viral load, or if it's something to do with the immune system. So I think that's where fatigue science in general uh, will add a lot of interesting diagnostics to this. One of the studies being proposed at NIH is looking at mitochondrial function in chronic fatigue patients, where if that's the energy producing part of the cell, and there's pathology there, we should be able to determine what it is and what to do about it. I gave you two questions before the meeting. Do I think, do I think spec scans are necessary to, to diagnose chronic fatigue syndrome? No, but they're very helpful. Spec scans of the brain generally show regional hypoperfusion or underperfusion to certain areas of the brain, uh, which may be amenable to specific treatments because different drugs work on different parts of the brain. And secondly, it's an objective marker of brain dysfunction, which can be very, very beneficial to patients and treating physicians. However, I do not believe, uh, I, I understand the differentiation that Dr. Hyde is making between ME and chronic fatigue syndrome, but I think it's one of semantics, and I don't think it's particularly useful with respect to research and treatment. <coughs> We'll be hearing from some of our school politicians in a minute. And I was just wondering if you have anything, any advice for them that you can say to them? <laughs> oh, I'm obviously to you, is it? Uh, I think it's a, obviously a real problem. It's pressing. It's very expensive. And I think any politician who's making decisions about how to manage a problem like this uh, for a country this size, should look at saving money by decreasing disability, saving money by decreasing diagnostics, and having comprehensive care available for these patients. I personally believe it's beyond the ability of primary care physicians to diagnose and treat, and the answer to that is establishing a, some sort of center of excellence. So I personally believe based on... Can you repeat the question? question? The question was that the politicians in this country should should and may be interested in uh, addressing this problem. And if that is true, what were my suggestions for possible uh, avenues to be taken? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, because there have been studies about this term Certainly, there have been attempts at plasma phoresis in chronic fatigue syndrome that did not show particular benefit. That's different than stem cell transplant, but uh, I don't know. Uh, it, maybe, maybe your address 
discussing the uh, rituxan trials for MS, in which rituxan is a drug that um, destroys mature B cells for up to a year. And it is true that in two recent studies, those patients have had very dramatic clinical responses, complete remissions in their uh, MS by removing the B cells. It's very, very interesting, but also potentially dangerous because a number of those patients developed uh, fluorid infections. <coughs> There, there are families that have um, unique circumstances of hereditability of CFSME. And we know the reasons. I'll give you an example quickly. Um, and then I want to hear from politicians. But the, uh, there are families where HHV6 variant A is chromosomally integrated and passed from parent to child. And oftentimes, the parent and the child will be sick with CFS. And there's other hereditary factors that undoubtedly come into play as well. Oh, I think we already have biomarkers. It just is that you must address subsets. You must recognize this is not one disease. So we already have biomarkers of patients who have RO reactivation, we have biomarkers of patients who don't, we have biomarkers of, of uh, genetic sequencing that's very useful. Cure? I'm waiting. <laughs> set up pilot programs to address exactly that. We're starting small so that we can do a, a very, we're going to start with 300 patients so that we can do exactly what we say we're going to do and institute this complete program. Once the piloting is under the way, we hope to collaborate with other centers in terms of, certainly in terms of the translational research. The reason I showed you the research we're doing is it's a very confined area of research into this disease. And every institution can't do everything. So we're hoping to collaborate with other institutions that are looking at uh, other aspects of the disease. Okay. Uh, I think it's time to break here for our summary. Thank you again, Dr. Peterson, for an excellent presentation.